Yeah, we can start. Okay. So welcome all of you to the ninth colloquium of ISAM. And today's speaker is Odet Heber, an old friend of mine. And uh, the, to introduce him, we will have Babo. And uh, uh, welcome everybody to this colloquium. Babo. Uh, yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it is it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my very, very good friend, Dr. Uded Heber from Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, Uded is, I mean, uh, okay, so Uded uh, did his uh, DSc from Technion, which is Israel Institute of Technology uh, in Haifa, and uh, postdoc from uh, Cyclotron Institute, in Texas KMN, uh, M uh, University and then joined Weizmann Institute of Science in 1989. And ever since, he has been a, a, a big pillar support of the molecular physics group in particle physics department of Weizmann Institute of Science. I had a, a, a privilege of working with him for three years in my postdoc. And it was a wonderful time that I had, and I learned a lot from him. Uded is co-inventor of uh, uh, electrostatic ion trap, which is also now called, uh, is also known as a Zeifman trap, along with Professor Daniel Zeifman. Um, and uh, they, 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 they study the, the, the negative ion clusters, so their uh, decays by uh, laser excitation and the subsequent storage. Um, and today we will hear something interesting about ultra fast to uh, ultra slow gas phase molecular dynamics using this ultra. So, David, please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure. And also, thanks, CP, for the invitation. Really, also an old friend. And uh, I hope to show you what uh, we have been done in the last few years and uh, what we are doing now. And uh, I hope it will be beneficial for all of us. And uh, I would like to see, uh, I would like to show you also that uh, beside the official title, I, since this is a colloquium in India, I would like also to show the much contribution of uh, Indian scientists to our research, which is really appreciated. And uh, I'll show you along the talk uh, what they did uh, in our lab. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is uh, some picture from the Institute. Right now, I'm, uh, I was supposed to sit here in the physics building, but uh, now it's uh, under spray for fire ants, so it's no, not allowed to be seated. So I am moved to here to our graduate school. So I'm one of the classes here right now. Uh, this is a physics building, which is, I'm not there right now. Okay, a few numbers about the Whiteman Institute since maybe some of you or most of you do not know. Uh, we are only a science uh, institute and uh, we have only a graduate school, which is uh, about 1450 graduate students and postdoc. And 196 are from India, which is really a large number and a big contribution to our institute. We have about uh, 280 research groups and some money, advice, uh, which is not very important, and some ranking, which also depends what you are choosing, but uh, we are aiming uh, to be always in the top, but uh, more or less uh, we are about, at least in some ranking, uh, among the 10 most uh, ranked uh, institute, so this is nice. Here what you see is, uh, for example, Angela Mer Merkel visiting our lab a few years ago, and uh, this is Daniel Zeifan, the head of our group, also in the lab. He was, till last year, he was uh, the president of the institute for 13 years, quite a long time, but now he's back. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today I just give a brief introduction to many body physics and uh, time scales. 
and then I will talk uh, about fast interaction and control, and then about uh, delayed emission, which is longer time scale, and uh, show you a movie about uh, molecular spontaneous cooling, and the next steps, which will include some, well, actually these two steps will include some uh, unpublished uh, devices and uh, data, which I hope will be interested to you. So let's start with the uh, introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example of nuclear physics because in, in nuclear physics it's uh, well famous that we have so many nucleons and they are, have many lifetimes, uh, they are stable and unstable. And if I only look at the small part of the, this chart, which is uh, the neutron versus uh, proton chart, the famous one, look only on the bottom, you can see there are many different colors and the color code is given here. So you can see for different uh, neutron and proton, you have huge span of uh, uh, time dependent uh, uh, lifetime for 10 to the minus 15 until up to stable nuclei, which is huge, many, many orders of magnitude in time. And of course, always the question is why? Uh, so in order to do this, uh, I compare it to uh, molecules and to see whether it might be the same. And here is uh, the molecules and here the atomic nuclei. And one can see that uh, almost all the criteria are similar. Inside the few body problem and the Coulomb interaction and some nuclear forces, long, long short range forces, and quantum mechanics are all quite in common. So it's naturally to look at molecules in the same way that you look in the atomic nuclei in very large time scales from very fast to very slow. And this is exactly what I'm going to show here. And the first uh, scheme is what is called the uh, Yablonsky uh, energy diagram. And immediately you can see uh, the time scales. Uh, this is a ground state of a molecule, I mean, generic molecule. These are the excited electronic state. And here are some triplet state. You can see the first uh, interaction or the first uh, process is uh, excitation or absorption of photon. And this is the order of femtosecond, 10 to the minus 50. This is our, these are the green. And transitions. And then we have what is called the uh, internal conversion or vibrational relaxation, which are this yellow. And uh, this usually uh, do not uh, contain uh, emission of photons, but sometimes they do, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And this is in a slower time scale. And then we have fluorescence. I mean, we are in excited state, for example, the red lines. And this is in a scale of nanosecond to let's say to microsecond. And then there are uh, very long time scales. For example, going from uh, triplet state to ground state. And this is, can happen in millisecond to minutes. But also could be some uh, vibrational cooling using uh, uh, infrared emission, which is also in the millisecond range. And uh, I'll show you how all these processes are important in uh, when one uh, looking to a molecule. So this is our time scale. And now let's see the beginning. What's happened in the beginning? Why we look at uh, this time scale, the short time scale of 10 to the minus 15 femtosecond. And the question is, what is the starting point? How fast an interaction with the photon is? And fortunately, this was answered uh, recently by this paper in Nature, which called the absolute timing of photoelectric effect. I mean, it, it was speculated all the time by calculation and so on, but the absolute time was first measured here. And uh, this is more or less what measure, was measured. I won't go into details, but this was measured by uh, XUV near infrared uh, pump probe experiment. And they were measuring the electrons that was emitted due to a time delay between these two pulses and the kinetic energy released. And the overall uh, time that was uh, measured, the absolute time that was measured, depends of course on the uh, binding energy or actual photon was 
between, let's say, 20 attosecond to 100 attosecond. So this is the beginning of our time era because this is a starting point of uh, an interaction with an atom and the molecule. Okay, now let's see uh, if we can control this. And the first uh, question is, can one control or coherent control uh, the molecular dynamics? And uh, the question is, in order to do this, we cannot do it with a single photon. A single photon will only excite, and uh, then it depends on the molecule what happened. We cannot control it anymore after we shoot one photon. Then, therefore, we need a multi-photon process, or even uh, many, many photon process, uh, even strong pulses, in order to do this. And the next question is, assuming we have uh, n photons in our pulse, what is the best way to interact with a molecule to control the dynamics? And in our case, it's fragmentation. So this is a very crucial uh, question since we, if we want to control something that uh, will happen inside the molecule. And this was a question that uh, Weibuff and other people in our group uh, were, ask, were asking. And uh, they perform an experiment, which I'll show you in a minute, and then uh, draw some conclusion for this. And, uh, before the experiment, I, what, what one can do uh, with uh, such uh, pulse is to make a, an expansion of the Taylor series and, and uh, to understand each contribution uh, to the process. And uh, if I do this in the Taylor series, and this is uh, uh, the field of the pulse as a function of the frequency and the time, and uh, we can see there is a constant uh, or symmetric uh, contribution. And then the first one that is, has a correlation between the time and the frequency is uh, these uh, terms, which people are called the uh, chirp, chirp pulse. So if you have a chirp pulse, then this contribution is the most important one. Uh, we tried this as well, but we didn't see any uh, strong contribution to the uh, control of uh, the situation of a molecule. The first thing that uh, we did see a contribution was the third order dispersion, which is uh, to have uh, not a symmetric time uh, correlation between the frequency uh, and the time. And I'll show you in a minute what does it mean. But remember, this is the first contribution that uh, uh, we could see something. And uh, what is a third order dispersion? I sh will show here only the time dependent. There is also a frequency dependent. But for simplicity, I'll show the time dependent because this is the most important contribution. And you can see uh, the black curve is the, what is called the transform limit, which is a symmetric pulse. Uh, it's a certain number of photons, but if you tune it to have a third order dispersion, which this uh, unit, it's femtosecond to the cube, and the sign is negative, this is a time dependent signal that you get. And uh, you can have also uh, the opposite, uh, positive uh, third order dispersion, and you can get it just the opposite in time, just a mirror in time. Again, the same number of photon, but different shape. How do you do this and what is the experiment? And uh, this is a picture. You're using a titanium sulfur laser. It's a pulse transform limit I mean the black pulse. And you go through, through a grating and a telescope. And just in the parallel section of the telescope, you put an SLM, which, has, uh, which can do two things. It can change the phase of a frequency and uh, the uh, amount of uh, this frequency. So you can control both of them and uh, tailor any pulse that you want out of the original pulse. And then you focus it again to the rating and have uh, the new pulse. Then this new pulse is continue and meet uh, a molecular beam. In this case, it's H2 plus beam. If uh, nothing happened, then the H2 plus is going to the, this Faraday cup. If something happened, then, uh, for example, a dissociation, then there is a dissociating uh, fragment, H plus and H, and they are going to a detector, which is a three-dimension uh, imaging detector, position and time, 
And the result is uh, this, uh, this two dimension, two, two uh, diatomic molecule is a kinetic energy release. So this is an experiment and immediately I'll show you the results. And this is a result. And uh, you can see here uh, four examples of the results. This is a, a third order dispersion uh, amount. And on the top is a slice of the kinetic energy release that was measured in the detector. You can see for large kinetic energy release, not really an effect. And uh, when we go to low and lower kinetic energy release, until here, this kinetic energy is below 0.41 EV, you can see huge dependence in the, si in the sign of the third order dispersion uh, up to a factor of two. Uh, it doesn't mean that here there is nothing, but here we already have enough photons to do a dissociation anyway. So this is not sensitive. The first thing that is sensitive is a low kinetic energy release, which means that uh, uh, the initial uh, molecule sits in a lower vibrational level. Uh, so in order to understand why we have this, uh, we asked uh, Brett Elsry from Kansas State University to do some calculation. And this is a result of the, his calculation. And there are two figures here. The top one, uh, you can see the uh, remains of the, uh, uh, of the molecules. That means if you have lower number here, that means lower number of molecule remains and more uh, dissociating molecule happen. And uh, there are three colors, positive, uh, sorry, negative, third order dispersion, positive third order dispersion, and no third order dispersion, which is a transfer limit with this uh, similar uh, photon distribution or amount, let's say. And you can see indeed that for negative, uh, negative third order dispersion sign, you can see more dissociation. This is going lower. Uh, and the question is why? Of course, you can also say that it's happened first. This is a time scale. It's happened before the pulse is uh, really finished or getting to its time zero. And in order to understand why, we, we can look at the uh, second figure, the bottom one, and we can see here, this is the alignment. Uh, I mean, the correlation between the molecular axis to the field axis. And you can see what's happened with the red one, which is a negative uh, third order dispersion sign. There is a huge alignment in the beginning of the pulse, I mean, before zero. And then when the rest of the pulse is coming, then you have a lot of dissociation. And I remind you what is a pulse. This is a negative pulse. And what's happened, this small tail, or uh, I mean, uh, leading uh, edge of the pulse is actually aligning the molecule before the strong pulse is coming, which during the dissociation. Here, there's no alignment. You immediately have uh, many photons and you dissociate what to dissociate. And the rest of the photons are not used because it's, they're, they're not strong enough. So this is a, let's say, more or less hand-waving, but uh, of course it's calculation. Uh, uh, why this is uh, the third order dispersion is very important because you align the molecule. And this was published a few years ago already uh, when uh, the experiment was done and Bible was into my own institute, but uh, analyzed later. So this was, uh, uh, let's say, the first uh, interaction that we have measured. Uh, so we are now in the time scale here, in the 10 to the minus 15. So let's go farther. And why this is important? So I'll give you uh, some evidence and uh, motivation. First of all, evidence in calculation. This is a calculation that I'll show you in a minute by Albert Stoller from Canada. And uh, what he calculate is a prediction for XFEL plus infrared time um, pump probe experiment. And uh, these are the prediction for this molecule, two carbon and four hydrogen. Uh, they have two different uh, isomers and a few different uh, uh, processes that can happen. And uh, this is a pump uh, energy. And this is a time delay between the pump and the probe. And when the time is in the order of tens of femtosecond, you can clearly see uh, in the calculation, you can clearly see what process happened uh, 
uh, after the pump. However, when you go to longer time scale, and not much longer, like this is 104 millisecond, uh, sorry, femtosecond, you can clearly see that something new happened here. And this something new is stronger than what was happened here. And also the calculation already, uh, finished at 140 or 150 femtosecond, but probably the process is not finished yet. So the most important process is going even farther. So this is a theoretical calculation. And uh, of course, it's not easy to calculate uh, in a very good accuracy up to a very long time. But uh, you see that it's needed. And the next thing I saw you also an experiment that uh, this is needed. And this is uh, another field of experiment. This is collision. Uh, for example, this molecule collides with an argon at uh, 8 keV. If you look at time of flight of uh, the results of this collision, this is what you see. You see mainly two peaks and some uh, smaller uh, contribution background. And uh, so this is a normal time of flight that uh, one can see from such a collision. However, when you add another uh, degree of information, which is the velocity or the energy, if you want, you can see completely different picture. This is a picture that you see in this uh, uh, publication. You can see there is another process that hardly could see could be seen here, and it's going for a long time. And if you measure for a longer time, usually time of flight is in microsecond range, but if you could measure for a longer time, this might be the strongest uh, process that happened after such a collision. Uh, so this is a conclusion. If you don't measure long enough, you might miss the strongest process in your collision. So this is, happened in photon, this happened in collision. It's the same process. And this leads me to what we call the uh, delayed processes. And uh, I give some motivation, uh, general motivation. For example, what's happened in our eye. Uh, this is uh, how we see. We have uh, two molecules, uh, retinal, and the difference between this is a cis and trans is the, the angle here, only one angle. So if our eye observe a photon, there is a, a transition isomerization between this uh, molecule to, the, to this molecule, to this uh, uh, isomer. And uh, it's very important to go back by enzyme or any other process in order that our eye will be active. Otherwise, if we observe too many photons and nothing uh, will be relaxed, then we will be blind. And this, uh, for example, what's happened when you, you, you see a flash of uh, light, you are blind because all the molecules here. So this is a very crucial uh, uh, process, how to go back to the uh, cis retina. Another example is that uh, I identified infrared band. This is uh, what you see when you look at the uh, inter uh, medium, interstellar medium. Uh, you can see infrared uh, light in certain uh, wavelengths, which attribute to all kinds of CC spread, CH, and uh, other attributes, but not, but not to small molecules, but to very large molecules, which called the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. And what we see is the infrared emission due to uh, UV or visible light that excited this molecule. So this is all okay. I mean, you observe the infrared, but what's happened, for example, if what you see, I mean, the infrared emission is only a slow part of the emission and you have another uh, relaxation uh, process that uh, will uh, make the infrared emission much less pronounced. Then the end result will be, will be that we have much more polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon than we see. And so much more that uh, it's, it's more carbon than existing. And this is uh, really uh, what's happened if we assume other process. And there are evidence, and I'll show you in a minute, there are other processes that are faster than the infrared emission. And uh, therefore the estimation of the, how much uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, how much carbon in the universe, or in the, at least in the interstellar media, might be wrong. 
and uh, they might be wrong, but it needs to be studied. And this is another motivation. So how we do it? Uh, we do it in three stages. First, we store, store or trap molecules. Then we excite them after time T. The T can be from microsecond to whatever. And when we measure the result after time T, uh, in a time that is dt. And dt must be at least in the order of magnitude of the process that happened. Otherwise, we, as I told you before, we will miss uh, what's happening. And uh, these are the people that did the, uh, the experiment, among other, of course. And uh, there are some publications that uh, we did uh, in the last few years. We did a lot of uh, experiment with this. And here are some contribution. I hope that uh, you know them. Uh, so let's go to the experimental setup. Experimental setup is uh, contains of uh, an electrostatic uh, iron beam trap. In this case, we called it the band trap. And in the beginning, I'll show you uh, how it works. We have here an electrostatic uh, mirror, and here another electrostatic mirror, and we can inject ions inside this electrostatic mirror, and they are just bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. What we can also do is to have a deflector and then they can bounce between other two mirrors, I mean, at least one of the other two mirrors. Then after the, what I call the capital T of trapping, we shoot a laser. A laser is coming through here. And as a result of the laser, there might be some neutrals that can be uh, produced along here and measured by this MCP. So this is an experiment. You trap ions, molecular ions, you shoot a laser, and you look neutral as a function of time after the laser uh, was uh, interact with a beam. This is a pulse laser. And this is a typical experimental data. So what you see, you see here is the uh, neutrals that are measured in this detector. And this is a trapping time. You start at trapping time at zero, you trap ions, and after 250 milliseconds, you release the ion. And in the beginning, you see a lot of neutrals. This is due to spontaneous decay. Remember this, there is a spontaneous decay of the molecules uh, that without anything, you, you can observe them. But then after a while, you don't see uh, any significant uh, neutrals beside the collision with the residual gas. So the neutrals that you see here is residual gas collision that produce neutrals. At some point you shoot a laser, in this case it's 190 milliseconds after the trap uh, begin. And you see huge enhancement, this is a log scale, a semi log scale, you see huge enhancement of the neutrals on this detector, and then nothing. If we increase, if we zoom out this, this is what we see. We see that after the laser shooting, we see a lot of neutrals are produced above the background of the residual gas collision. So something happened in a time which is in the order of a millisecond. And this is the information that we are looking and making our models and conclusion using this information, the delayed emission. What one can see, here are two examples of uh, C5 minus and C6 minus, two typical uh, delayed emission shapes. One is uh, the red one is exponential decay. It's exponential because this is a log-log scale. And this now look exponent in a log-log scale and the uh, red line is a fitting to uh, exponent. And there is a power law scale of the C5 minus. Two different scale, uh, two different behaviors, and also two different uh, time scale. This is uh, very fast and this is relatively slow. Again, this is a log scale. Uh, and uh, we call this two different process. The, 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 the one the, which is a power law, we call it the infrared emission or thermionic emission in the bulk. Uh, which is a power law, and uh, the, the uh, exponential one is a recurrent fluorescent or electronic transition, which is faster process. And this faster process may be also, as I told you, may be important in the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. 
this process. There are some evidence for this. I won't talk about it. Uh, so the shape again is uh, our information and we can have two information. We can have information, uh, what was the initial distribution before we shoot the laser and what is the process after we shoot the laser, I mean the relaxation process. Both of them are contribute to this shape. And in order to uh, show this, I'll give you a longer example. Uh, this is C10 minus. C10 minus is very uh, interesting uh, molecule because it has uh, two isomers. It has a linear and monocyclic, which has, uh, this is a, the, the blue one is a C10 minus a ground state of the linear and the monocyclic. They are very close. And the neutral ones are not are very far. And there is a transition energy, uh, isomerization barrier uh, from going to linear to monocyclic. But this uh, level is above the uh, neutral one. So it's very interesting what's happened here. And uh, that's why we decided to study this. And the idea was uh, to shoot a laser below and above the isomerization barrier and look uh, on the delayed emission and try to understand which process happened and uh, how fast and uh, what is the contribution of each one of them. And uh, we did this experiment and these are the results. By, uh, this was done by Kushik. And we can see here two figures. The first one is uh, shooting, after, shooting the laser after 190 milliseconds of trapping and changing the wavelengths of the laser. And it's interesting to see that the blue one, which is the lowest uh, uh, energy of the photons, has a very fast decay in the beginning and then nothing later. And as you increase the photon energy, uh, you see more and more uh, decay, which is reasonable. Uh, but the shape is more or less uh, similar, and it's uh, again log log scale. The second one is the same experiment, but now looking, it's a single photon energy, a different time of trapping. For example, after 10 milliseconds of trapping the red one, you can see it's a faster decay than the 190 millisecond, which is a blue one. So this is somehow probing the temperature of the initial population of the molecule. And uh, the decay is uh, similar, but of course uh, you have to uh, take into account the initial distribution. So these are the data, but you can also see lines. The lines are, are statistical uh, calculation, statistical model calculation, and they are fit uh, very well to the data. I won't go to the details because it's uh, too technical and, and a little bit boring, but I can, uh, if you ask, I can go to it in the end. Anyway, i just give you the principle. The principle is this. You have a C10 minus linear, you photo excite it to C10 minus uh, linear excited, this one, and then you have different way to, uh, to decay. You have a delayed electron emission. You have a recurrent fluorescence, as we saw. You have infrared emission and you have isomerization. If you do isomerization, then you are again in other uh, process that can happen. The delayed electron emission of the cyclic and the infrared emission of the cyclic and uh, other are not important. Uh, I remind you that we are measure neutrals. So the two channels that lead to neutrons or this and this. These two channels are lead to neutral. This leads to C10 uh, linear, and this leads to C10 monocyclic neutrons. However, if you remember the, uh, the level diagram, this one is much less, uh, is much higher in energy, so we cannot reach it in our wavelengths, uh, laser wavelengths. So this is closed. So the only open channel is this one. So in order to go this, we are going this way, that way, we are doing isomerization and going this way and have neutrons. However, of course, when you go this way, all the rest are in competition. So you have to take it into account in, in the model. And this is what was done by Koshik. And this is the results. Before I go into details, just look at, the, this is the energy scale of the excitation, could be from laser, 
It could be from electron, could be from uh, collision, anything, just excitation. This is excitation energy. And this is the uh, rate coefficient. And look at the scales. It's from picosecond here to years. Single model that can explain uh, molecular uh, processes in a huge number of time scales. Uh, just give a short example. If I excite the molecule in 4.5 EV, doesn't matter uh, which excitation, what is the origin of the occasion, but this is excitation. So the first thing that uh, we have to go to the fastest decay rate. The fastest decay rate for the linear is a black one, is a black curve. The rest is a slower decay rate. The fastest, and this is isomerization. So the first thing that happened is, uh, sorry, is isomerization, and it's uh, happened in the microsecond uh, scale, let's say. But as soon as isomerization happened, we are jumping to here, because now we are in the cyclic, and this is much faster in the picosecond range, or 100 picosecond range. So by choosing an energy and following the fastest process, you can immediately see what's happened in the molecule in a huge number of uh, excitation and time scale. So this is very important to understand the process that happened uh, after exciting a molecule, such a curve. But if you remember, so far we have measured neutrons. And the uh, neutrals are nice, but they are not the only uh, outcome of um, such a process because for every neutral we have an electron. And uh, so this is another system which was built by uh, Anish and uh, was used by Koshik. Uh, we put a VMI uh, spectrometer inside the trap and we can use the same laser for either from here or from there. And the first thing that you see if you compare a molecule to an uh, atom atomic and negative, you can see a completely change in the shape of the uh, radius on the detector of the VMI. While for O minus, you see it has a normal distribution, uh, single energy distribution on the detector, it depends on the laser wavelengths. For the delayed emission, for the C5 minus, you see a very small energy. It's uh, in the milli, milli V range. So this distribution is this very small energy, which makes sense. I mean, uh, uh, this is not a surprise, but it's nice to see it. Uh, but if you see the delayed emission, you can see other stuff. And uh, here I show you uh, an example. This is a, a molecule. And remember that I asked you to remember the C10 minus uh, fast decay in the beginning. This is not the C10 minus, this is another molecule, it doesn't matter. But you can see the fast decay. This is the decay along the beam line of the molecule, uh, a beam line inside the trap. So the, the ion is going this way, back and forth, and you can see uh, the line. The center part is much more uh, efficient. You can see much more strong because uh, this is how it is uh, designed. So the electrons that are going far from the spectrometer are not very efficient to be measured, but in the center they are very efficient to be measured. And that's why you see the peak. And this is a very narrow peak, which reminds the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, delayed electron emission at very, very low energy. But now you can put a laser. And now you can see the same experiment, but with a laser. So we have, once we shoot a laser, once we don't. Back and forth, and uh, we analyze the data with laser and without the laser. And this is with the laser, so you see additional. See additional electron beside uh, this fast, uh, and this, not, not fast, this uh, uh, low energy uh, released, you see also higher energy electron. And this is also an indication of what's happened in the molecule. And we can look at it as a function of time. This is exactly the experiment, uh, and this is an uh, unpublished data and uh, new experiment done by Abhishek and uh, Sugil. And uh, the experiment is done on OH minus. The reason to choose OH minus because it, uh, it has only a single uh, vibrational level that are relevant to us, and we can observe rotational level. And uh, this is a OH minus uh, ground state, and this is a neutral. And there are many, many, many transitions that can happen uh, after uh, laser absorption. And uh, uh, this will be reflected by the uh, electron spectrometer, uh, the, uh, the electron energy. 
And the best uh, one that I could see in the literature is this one. This is the best uh, energy spectrum of such an experiment. Uh, it was not published, but uh, it was in the PhD thesis. But this is uh, what you see, you see all the, I, I won't go to the details, but you see many, many, many lines. And uh, for each transition, you can see different uh, rotational level and so on. So this is uh, quite complicated, but very nice to play with. And uh, this is what we did. This is, by the way, the, the, this publication. The, I think it's, it's from ICPIC. And uh, this is again, what we did, we shoot a laser far from uh, from the uh, threshold which is zero and this is what we see we see mainly uh, two rings which reflect actually this transition and uh, mainly this transition and some tail of this transition but it's too complicated to analyze uh, for the rotational level and the resolution is not great so we decided to shoot a laser here when we shoot a laser it's much more simpler we see only this peak in the center and the tail here, which is uh, this tail, which is going quite far. Uh, and, uh, and it's much more simpler. We can make it even more simpler if we shoot the laser here. And then we see only the tail, only this part. And now we are clear that we see only a uh, manifold of rotational excitation here. Now we can look at uh, as a function of time. And for this, we can make a movie. And this is a movie. This is a movie of uh, this tail, and you can see how this tail behave as a function of time. And this is uh, actually taking picture of the molecule as a function of time, like a CT or... Uh, here you, you can see the time, it's almost uh, in second. It's almost real time. This is how the molecule behaves. This is how the rotational levels decay. Of these molecules. This is again raw data, but I think this is uh, uh, may show the power of, uh, of this uh, system that you can follow the uh, dynamics of the molecule in, in, in seconds, in seconds, and, and really have uh, information about the rotational decay, Einstein coefficient, and so on, which is a very strong tool. Okay, so now what next? Now we have seen that uh, we can measure up to seconds, right? So what about longer times? Do we need longer time? Maybe, but how can one can do it? And uh, what we need is better vacuum and uh, go into cryogenic to control the environment because uh, at some point uh, the environment in the black body radiation will influence our experiment. Therefore, we have to go to uh, one of the cryogenic electrostatic storage in CSR that's located in CSR in Heidelberg. And this is a, a electrostatic storage. I won't go into details of the instrument. I'll show you that uh, we are using this uh, side, which is a photon ion interaction. All, all of this is in a cryogenic environment. And uh, I'll show you the first results that uh, we got for uh, delayed emission. And uh, this is a first result for aluminum 4 minus. Uh, I won't go again to the details, it's too long, but what one can see is after shooting a laser and pulse, you can see a set of delay pulses, which happens due to uh, there is a short overlap between the laser and the ion, so each time there are neutrals that are uh, ejected as a, as a result of the laser, there are uh, either in the same cycle or later in a, in a different cycle, you can see the neutrals that are ejected because of the partial overlap uh, with the ion beam. And you can integrate all this signal and plot it as a function of two parameters. One parameter is a time, the time that uh, the ions were in the uh, ring before the laser was shot. And the, the other one is the energy of the photon. And you can see this preliminary results immediately that uh, the distribution of the uh, delayed emission, which I told you it's uh, influenced, it's uh, reflecting uh, the, uh, the initial distribution is changing as a function of time. So even after two minutes, which is this one, the uh, purple one, still 
uh, you see dynamics inside uh, the molecule. And again, uh, this is uh, show you that uh, the dynamics happened for a long time, can happen for a long time. Now I'm going to the last part is uh, what next. And there are many things, but I'll show you only one thing. And uh, this is uh, the new project that uh, we are doing now uh, in collaboration with the Hubie University. And uh, the idea is to have a, put a trap inside the trap. And um, the first trap, the inner trap, is for low, low energy uh, ions, so molecular ions. For this example, they are positive, but it doesn't have to be positive. So they are trapped in the inner trap. And then, after a while, we, we uh, inject uh, higher energy. Uh, molecules, larger mass, so that in the center they'll have the same velocity and they can interact with a uh, very low velocity and then we can measure the results whether it's neutral or high, high, high energetic uh, molecule, we can measure it outside or we can shoot a laser. So this is a new, new device for molecular ion, molecular ion interaction. And uh, what is the status of this? You can see uh, Raj and Abhishek uh, working on assembly this uh, this device. And uh, this is in the Weizmann Institute, and uh, it was transferred a few months ago, I mean, before the corona, and uh, actually last year, it was transferred to the Hebrew University, which is a location. And you can see here the first inserting of the device into the vacuum vessel, and uh, um, so this is now slide in, so one unit that slides in, and the status right now, in, uh, uh, this month, is we have successfully trapped a test for both traps. So we, we can trap separately uh, both, uh, with both traps. Of course, the second trap uh, with the condition of the first trap uh, with high voltage already. So this is exactly the condition of two ion beams. The problem right now that we are uh, transferring our source to, uh, to be both positive and negative, using one source both for positive and negative, and this is now under development. Hopefully in the next few months, we will have the first uh, two ion beam trapped. Okay, so that's getting into a summary. I hope that I show you that uh, Gas phase uh, dynamics can be manipulated for very many orders of magnitude in time, and it's important to follow all of them. Uh, this is a second that once you do an experiment or you do a calculation, you you have to know what is the time scale of, uh, of the results, because if you stop your experiment on your calculation uh, before, uh, before the actual uh, process, then you may miss a significant part of your results. So, must be aware of this. And many times it's okay to stop at some point, but you have to be aware of uh, this. And I think this is the uh, most important part that I would like to emphasize in this talk to be aware of the time scale that uh, the process happened uh, before you declare the results are so and so. This is a list of honor for the Indian guys that helped along the years. And uh, of course, I thank them, and thank you. And uh, before I finish, I would like to uh, make a declaration about uh, our new uh, electrostatic storage device uh, meeting that will happen, hopefully, if we'll, it will be allowed in, in June 2021, so in the next summer. And uh, we are looking for contribution, and uh, there's some travel allowance. And if you're interested, you're more, more than welcome. And uh, since uh, this is our uh, New Year Eve today, so I wish you all Happy New Year, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you again. Yeah, take will take over. Yeah, I'll take over. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So thanks, uh, Dr. Heber, for a very nice talk. Uh, what I found really fascinating is that uh, we are normally told that one of the 
uh, one of the few physical quantities which have huge uh, spans of the magnitude is the resistivity of a material and 15 orders of magnitude is something that people often talk about in the context of the values of uh, resistivity of materials but here in your talk you have uh, shown us that uh, these kind of extreme ranges of values of a physical parameter can be very important even in the context of molecules uh, and uh, this really was a very fascinating talk i think another another point i would like to uh, mention here is the virtue of patience so you said that uh, you shouldn't stop your calculation very early uh, let it go for a longer time and you might discover some very interesting and very significant processes happening over long time scales so the virtue of patience cannot be understated uh, thanks for a very nice talk Thank you. Uh, the session is open for discussions and i invite uh, questions preferably in the chat box which i'll then relay to dr hayward uh, yeah i can start uh, yes i'm receiving questions here so the first question is in the new trap i think uh, uh, jyoti is referring to the hybrid trap is the center of mass velocity for the two ion systems zero well the, it's it's never zero uh, but it's very low. I mean, we are aiming to <clears throat> to in the 10 milli EV range of uh, relative uh, velocity, relative energy, let's say. It's, uh, the main uh, problem is always the angle. Uh, if it's parallel, then it's okay, but it's never parallel. According to the simulation by us and by other similar or other devices that can do this, You are muted, Odette. Odette, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. And somebody has a huge background noise, thumping background noise. Yeah. Okay, now it's quiet. Uh, Dr. Heber, can you come back on? You are muted still. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now I'm okay? Yes. Yes. Now you're fine. Sorry, I, I didn't notice this. Okay, so I answer again. Yeah. Uh, it's never zero because uh, the, the, the mo mo most problematic part is uh, to having an angle between the two bins. And, uh, we design it and uh, due to simulation and looking in other people that are doing the merge beam and so on. Uh, so it's about uh, 10 milli electron volt that uh, our goal. I think we can achieve that this uh, that the zero will be in the order of 10 milli electron volt relative energy. Okay, the next question is uh, from David Joseph. Uh, he's asking whether you could use white light, uh, I mean, a continuum source uh, for these experiments. Of yeah, we are, yeah, we are using, uh, mm -hmm. yes. We are using both. We are using pulses and we are using uh, CW pulse, uh, CW lasers. Sure. Uh, no, so uh, his, his question is about the wavelength, continuum as in white light, not uh, continuous. Oh, ah, oh, sorry. Well, we, we can use white light, but uh, it will be hard to Just explain what's going on. I mean, uh, it's better to have some defined energy. If you want other energies, that's fine. but. Uh, use all of them together, it's, it will be hard to analyze, I think. Okay, there are, are there any more questions? Yeah, can I, can I ask one? Sure, sure, Bebo, go ahead. Yeah. So, Odeh, in that um, electron uh, uh, image that uh, you had where the rotational, uh, you are looking at the rotational levels of OH minus or OH actually. Uh, as you showed that as a function of time, the, the, the size of the image shrinks. Does that mean that the higher rotational levels actually give away the electrons faster? You, you mean here? Uh, no, the next one. You are using the movie. You showed us a movie, no? As a function of time, the 
the size of the the size of the image shrinks right yeah so does that mean that the higher rotational levels are actually depleted by electron ejection in the beginning yes yes you you are right i didn't explain it very well but i can show you here what we see is this is this manifold and this is a, a rotation 2 3 4 5 and 6 for the p3 transition so if there is a decay from let's say from higher rotational level to 2 then the the tail here is shrinking to to here so if everything will be in 2 of course 1 uh, and 0 uh, we don't measure with this transition then we see only one peak here which is white might be uh, narrow so what we see is a decay of this rotational level to uh, j equal to 2 okay. is this answer your question yeah 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 so i i but but you can't resolve these rotational levels right i mean even after doing abel inversion you can't resolve these levels is it right we cannot resolve it uh, this is a limitation of our spectrometer huh? because we built our spectrometer to be more for delayed emission and uh, we concentrate on the time time domain and not on the uh, energy domain but this is a technical reason yes okay because it would have been easy you know, it would have been interesting to see whether the higher rotations uh, by some means Uh, delay the emission of the electron because there is another uh, variety of uh, anions where you can have a higher rotation stabilizing the anion right yes uh, this is uh, uh, this is what uh, shown here this is actually uh, the spontaneous decay without any laser hmm. you can look at this spontaneous decay as a function of time Thanks thanks for this. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Uh another question from Jody what is the yeah what is the mass limit on the trap ions in the new trap? Okay the the mass limit is uh, uh actually you have no mass limit. Uh, this is a electrostatic trap. Okay. so any energy a uh, certain energy will uh, will trap any mass however if you want to uh, put two masses together then you have a limit uh, b- in between the masses uh, practical limit let's say which uh, you want your detector will work and so on uh, and it's a order of a uh, factor of 20 between the masses i guess it is answer the question Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, no more questions unless there is somebody who is raised a hand and I can't see. Okay, so let us thank uh, Dr. Heber for a very nice uh, talk, and uh, let us hope uh, we. have many more people participating in these experiments and perhaps also in the conference that you have announced and uh, wish you a happy new year thank you very much thank you thank you thank you sipi okay bye 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 everybody bye everybody